so we're going to be talking about one of the components in Vertica, which is called the database designer. Um, so this is going to be kind of the outline I have in mind. I'm going to be talking to you, describing, giving you a high-level description of what this component is and why we need it. Uh, talk about a more detailed description of the algorithms and the workflow that we use in this, and some of the ways in which. So this is a component that was originally built about four years back. So some of the scaling problems we had and different ways in which it has evolved over the last few years. Right, so this component is very similar to what some other database vendors would call an index advisor or an automatic index, index builder, right? So you have this DBD black box, and I swear when I looked at it at home, it wasn't actually a black box there, but uh, so you have the data and you have some idea of what you want to do with it, right? So you run it through this component and then you wind up with data which is going to be physically organized across a Vertica cluster in exactly the way that you want that is going to optimize your performance going forward. So what the database designer does, as I say here, is it's gonna design a bunch of projections and I'm gonna get into what we really mean by projections in a little more detail here, which is basically the way we physically organize data within the system. And it allows people with little or no knowledge of Vertica's internal architecture to take full advantage or almost full advantage of the system. And the, we also have a number of different knobs with which you can actually tailor the, de the design such that it meets different requirements. So if you want to speed up load, you want to speed up queries, you want to speed up different kinds of things, then the, there are various knobs you can tune. So before we get into the details of how the DBD actually operates, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's the goal that it's actually trying to achieve. So in the Vertica world, we are a regression database system, right, basically. So, but in our world, we don't really have anything called a table within the system itself. A table in the, in the create table statement from SQL is basically just a logical representation of what the data should be. The physical storage mechanism, which actually contains the data, is called a projection, and uh, each projection is gonna have, is gonna be, uh, contain a subset of columns or attributes from, a, from one or more tables, but most importantly, we are going to sort these projections based on some subset of columns, right? So this is going, to, so, and then we are going to distribute the data across the cluster in some, in some manner. So these two things are probably the most important things which are going to determine how well queries perform in a vertical system. So as you can imagine, I have a projection with 10 columns, C1 through C10. Deciding which columns I want to sort on and how I distribute the data across the system are non-trivial uh, problems. And these are basically going to, these are going to be the most defining attributes of, of, uh, of, of the performance of the system going forward. So in addition to these, these columns in projections are going to be encoded and compressed and I want to find, we have different kinds of encoding mechanisms and I want to choose the best one obviously to minimize storage. And in addition to all this, I want to make sure that I achieve fault tolerance through, uh, through some kind of replication, basically. So we want to uh, assure, assure ourselves that there are enough replicas of the data floating around the system such that we can have more than one node, or we call it the K-safety mechanism, where basically we can afford K nodes to fail in a vertical cluster. So the idea of behind the DB designer is to actually come up with a set of projection definitions for some set of tables that you uh, have defined in a Vertica system. So a little more background here. We run the DBD in two different modes mainly. We have something called the comprehensive mode and something called the incremental mode. So the comprehensive mode is basically, think of it as a fresh Vertica installation and you're just loading data into the system. The comprehensive mode is what you run during the setup process to come up with the most efficient storage organization and it's, it's like a complete overhaul of the system, right? You start from scratch. The incremental mode is where you're trying to, uh, you already have a production cluster up and running and now you want to fine tune it because of some change in requirements. You're, you have new tables, you have schema changes, you've got a different workload that you now want to optimize and so on. So these are, kind, these are the main two categories in which, you will, which we will expect to run the DBD. In addition to that, we have other knobs which you can tweak to, uh, to achieve some kind of a physical storage organization which is optimized for query performance versus optimized, for, uh, optimized to minimize your storage footprint. So this is kind of the workhorse slide here, right? So I'm gonna give you a description of 
this is uh, this is intended to describe the actual algorithm which is uh, which the DBD runs. So you have a bunch of these customizable input parameters which go into the DBD, and it starts off with these the obvious ones, right? You have the design schema, the tables that you're going to decide for, some amount of data for those tables that you're trying to decide, uh, come up with projections, some queries, which is basically a representative workload that you want to optimize performance for, and a bunch of other knobs which tweak the design decisions in various ways. So the box at the bottom left corner, the query optimization phase, is basically, uh, the, is probably the most interesting uh, part of the DBD. Right. So the way it works is it's going to look at the input query set, extract what we call interesting column sets from these queries. So what is an interesting column set in a SQL query, right? So these are columns which are going to appear in the query, obviously, and they appear in certain places where they perform some interesting functions. For example, join keys in a SQL query uh, or group by keys in a query. So we want to extract these interesting column sets put them together in various ways such that, put them together in ways we think will, benef will benefit some queries, right? So and these are what we call sort orders. We're putting them together with the intention of sorting them. So you have columns C1, C2, C3, which appear in a join, and some other columns which appear in some other operation in the query. We want to compose these into one projection, and we want to find the best way to sort these columns uh, such that as many queries as possible in the workload are going to benefit from this. So once you have these sort orders or these working sort orders, you also want to enumerate segmentation. So a query, a projection is going to be segmented again by a hash on some set of columns, in, in, uh, some set of its columns. And this hash value is going to determine which node in the vertical cluster that a particular row for that projection is going to wind up on. Okay, so based on these two, uh, uh, these two working definitions of uh, sort orders and segmentation, we generate what we call candidate projections, which are which we think was which which we think are going to benefit the query. These are in turn fed into the optimizer to check whether they really do benefit a query or whether these are just whether the DBD is actually making wild guesses. So based on this iterative loop, we then go go back and keep generating more sort orders until we hit certain budgets that we pass in through the parameters on top. So at the end of this, we have a bunch of what we call winner projections, which are basically a bunch of sort orders and segmentations for certain projections. And now we want to find the best encoding for these projection columns. And uh, this we do through some kind of empirical analysis of the actual data. And uh, I'll talk a little more about how that works, but basically we have different encoding options for different data types in, in a projection column, and we look, we actually compress some sample data and we try to figure out which is going to uh, work best for this projection, for this sort order, and so on. So once I've gone through all this, I have a final design for, uh, for my database, right? So the question is, do I, th th there are two ways in which the database design is typically used. We have the DBD which is shugging away and then it can automatically deploy a design in a cluster, right, which is the first picture on the left. The way it works is it's gonna create these projections, it's gonna load data into these projections, it's gonna clean up after itself by dropping old projections which it thinks are no, are no longer necessary for the system. So, and that, right? The other way in which the DBD is typically applied is when you, as you can imagine, the DBD is somewhat of a resource intensive process, right? It's, it, it does a whole bunch of, it's a very, sophisticated search and optimization problem. So it's gonna use up a lot of resources during its processing. And a lot of people don't want to slow up their production cluster with a lot of this extraneous processing. So what they do is they import whatever relevant data, data they need into a development cluster, and the DBD can also produce a deployment script which can then be used to reorganize data in a production cluster. Okay. so. In my mind, I think about the different ways in which the DBD has evolved over the past few years in terms of two main categories, right? So I'll call this the Avenue 1. I will touch briefly upon this, but I think Avenue 2 will be more interesting for this audience. So within this, we have like two main subcategories, right? So we have 
a constant development in a product company, we, we're going to keep supporting new SQL constructs. So somebody in the execution team is going to build a new and improved join operator. Somebody in the optimizer team is going to build, uh, is going to support a new kind of SQL query which we hadn't seen previously supported. So we need to be constantly evolving the DBD to handle these new features that are being built into Vertica. In addition to that, we have completely new features which are released, right? We have ways in which, in Vertica, we just uh, heard a talk on live aggregate projections, which are going to be something like materialized views, but how can we judiciously uh, create these based on, a, on, a, on, the, on an analysis of th query workloads? Unstructured tables, how are we, how, we have a mechanism in Vertica for dealing with unstructured data. Uh, so how do we optimize performance on those things? So these are some of the new uh, ways in which the DBD constantly has to play catch up. The other thing is we have to incorporate previously unthought of domain knowledge into the decision making process of the DBD. So an interesting story, we recently have found out that there was this engineer who was actually using information about correlated columns, right? So think of a table which has a column called zip code and a column called state, for example, right? So these two columns are going to be obviously very highly correlated. So putting them together is going to increase data locality and going to lead to better compression if you're going to sort on these columns, right? So this is actually a huge feature which previously was not part of the DBD workflow. So things like these we have to keep assimilating into the DBD uh, knowledge pool. The second avenue is basically, this was built four years back, right? And in those days, several gigs of data was considered big. Terabytes were like huge, right? So now we have, we routinely talk about uh, clusters with uh, dozens and hundreds of nodes, of, uh, and then we talk about several petabytes of data in those clusters, right? So consequently, we also have very complex schema by which I mean you have large number of n numbers of tables, no longer do we want to optimize for just tens of tables in the database designer, we have very huge schemas and huge workloads. In fact, recently I was talking to uh, one of the customers who uses Vertica, and they, they actually provide database analytics as a service, right? So users typically have their own schemas, and they create their own tables, and they run their own queries, and the vendor is actually going to handle the data management operations there, the DBA operations, including fine-tuning query performance as needed. So in their case, they actually have things with uh, several thousands of tables, and they're trying to optimize query workloads with several tens of thousands of queries, right? And we just talked about how this is actually a fairly sophisticated search and optimization problem, which requires a lot of processing, except this was originally built to, for, for the whole data set to fit in memory and then to run the whole thing, right? So, which, which worked fine four years back. It doesn't anymore, or it doesn't work as well anymore. So, how do you deal with large volume of data? So, one way of saying large volume data, I'm talking about tables with billions of rows in them, right? One of, when I was talking about this problem to one of the HP fellows at uh, a few years back, this is what he said. What can you really infer for your purposes from a billion rows of data that you cannot from a million, right? So most of the statistical properties that we are going to use, for example, in deciding what kind of encoding to choose for a projection column can easily be uh, determined by aggressively sampling the data and then performing whatever analysis you need to do on them. So obvious solution, right? Except now, you're, again, sampling itself is going to be a big problem when you're dealing with these huge data sets. Now, so consequently, we have, so think about this. So in, the, in the old days, we had, when you wanted to downsample from a table, you would create a SQL query, tag on a where class, which says random less than 0.1, for example, to, if you want to sample 10% of the rows. This has this unfortunate effect of actually reading the entire row from disk and then applying this crazy filter called random, which doesn't need that row to be run at all, and then skipping over to the next row in the table, right? So we, so we came up with new ways of actually, uh, with better sampling algorithms, which read just the amount of, disk, uh, amount of data from disk that you need in order to run your analysis. And as I was just describing, this is hugely beneficial in the storage optimization phase of the DBD where you, where you have to, 
empirically evaluate the data. Complex schemas, how do you deal with thousands of tables which are passed in here? So standard answer here, we just want to throw as many resources as we can into this processing uh, uh, operation and uh, basically hope for the best, right? I mean, of course, we have to spend, this is easier said than done, you have to spend a fair amount of time trying to compartmentalize, identify and compartmentalize those portions of the workflow which are actually parallelizable and then doing it. Um, I was just describing how the DBD is used in two different modes. We have the comprehensive mode where you, you're okay, you're, you're, the expectation is that this is gonna do a complete overhaul of the system, so if it's gonna take a fair amount of time it's, that's, and resources, that's okay, versus the incremental mode where you're trying to fine tune the system, but you don't want other processes to get totally blacked up, uh, blocked out. So you, we also have a way in which you can throttle back how many resources you throw at this process. The next problem I was talking about was these large workloads, right? So the original recommendation, again, four years back, was feed the DBD a small set of queries that you want to optimize for, which that are representative of your workload, right? Uh, the original developers had in mind at most like tens of queries, right? Which, which is, may have been okay back in the day. So obvious problems here, right? So what is small? Uh, is 10 queries small, is 100 queries small? What is representative? We don't know, right? Uh, especially when you have a large number of queries, there's no way for a human to actually sit down and analyze what queries are representative of that workload. In fact, in lots of cases, we have inputs coming in from query logs, queries that have been run over the last month, week, whatever it is, right? And quickly adds on, uh, piles up. Thankfully, most of these large query workloads that people were trying to work on we could see that uh, most of these queries either had duplicates or, or were structurally very similar. So think of this, think of a reporting tool, right? You're going to aggregate data from, say, the previous week, and now you're going to, and going to do your analysis on that data, and now you're going to report that data. And you want to do the same thing the next day or the next week. So the only thing that's going to change in those two queries is the actual date predicate, right? So we, uh, Plus, if you have different queries in analytic workloads, people try to do somewhat similar operations, but they're gonna write their own queries. So we have various differences between, uh, I mean, large amount of similarity between a large number of queries in that work set, workload, right? So what we do is we actually come up with a quantitative measure of the influence each query will have on the DBD decision-making process, right? So for example, you have queries which are trying to join the same tables on the same columns, these are going to be very, this is gonna have a very high, these two queries are gonna have a very high impact on how they influence the DBD decision making process. And you're gonna group by on the same columns, you're gonna have predicates on the same columns, things like that. So these are the different dimensions across which I will measure the performance or the, the, or the influence of each query on the DBD design, and based on that you can, we found that most of these analytic workloads, which span thousands or tens of thousands of queries, quickly whittle down to manageable amounts. And that's gonna give you a very, that's gonna significantly improve the quality of the DBD design because now you don't have a lot of noise cluttering up a lot of your search space. Uh, I mean, if you have too many queries, you basically wind up with trying to chase down too many garden paths and you have heuristics to cap off your memory consumption and things like that, so you wind up searching less of the search space than you would like. So this is one way of uh, solving that. So I was just talking about two or three different approaches uh, to solving, or at least, of attempting to solve the big data aspects or the large data set aspects of this automatic projection design problem. And uh, these are not generic solutions which are going to, uh, I mean, these are not gonna scale if you, for example, this solution is not gonna work if you're gonna throw a million uh, distinct queries at the DBD, right? If they are truly distinct queries, you still don't know if this is gonna, you, in fact, I guarantee that this is not gonna work. It's gonna be completely ineffective. So these are basically engineered solutions to some narrow, narrowly defined problems, uh, which is why they are part of the Vertica product and not in a paper at Sigmod.